Welcome back to The Wrestling Room and welcome back to our journey through the Book of Acts. I say through lightly because the first group of teachings is really preparatory. In fact, much of it is drawn from the end of the Book of Luke and the Book of John uh, as we ease our way into the Book of Acts. And here's why. The Bible is not just meant to be read. It's meant to be experienced, to be felt. You have to put yourself in the shoes, in the hearts, in the minds of the characters. And when you do, you experience the scripture in a whole different way. It almost is like walking through the back of the wardrobe into Narnia. It opens up and becomes a whole different experience. And as the Holy Spirit uh, enlightens your mind and you travel with him teaching you uh, Bible study and a study of the characters of scripture and the situations of scripture just comes alive. Um, I want you to know that that experience that I just described is available to you in the word of God. And that is my hope and passion as I teach through the book of Acts that you will see this drama in a way that you never have. It'll come alive to you. So I'm going to read one verse. I'm going to teach out of one verse. I'll introduce it with the first two verses, but we're in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 3 today, and I'm just going to pull a little bit from there, and the next couple of weeks we'll actually go back to that verse. But, but travel with me, because we're going to be traveling all over the scripture in the process. So I'm going to pray, then we'll read the scripture, and we'll dive right in. So Lord, give us wisdom. Guide us, lead us, teach us, Holy Spirit, open our minds and hearts. Show us what was going on in your heart, O oh God, and in the hearts of the disciples prior to the birthing of this world-changing, brand new baby church of which we are part. Lord, we long for you to show us this in color, in 3D. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So go to Acts chapter 1 with me, and let's just read the first three verses as an introduction, and then we'll launch from there. Luke is uh, writing, he's writing to Theophilus, and here's what he says in verse 1. He said, the first account, that's the book of Luke, I composed, Theophilus, about all Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Here's verse 3. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. It was July 1961 and 38 members of the Green Bay Packer football team were sitting in the locker room on the first day of training camp. The year before, just prior, they had ended their season with a bitter loss to the Philadelphia Eagles, losing in the last minutes of the game. And so here they are, gathered in the locker room, getting ready to start their next season, having just sat in the bitterness and disappointment of uh, victory being snatched from them right at, the, right at the end of the game. And so into the locker room walks Vince Lombardi in all of his grandeur, this, this amazing coach who would become one of the great coaches of all of history. He walks into the locker room and standing in front of them, he did something that that summer of 1961 became a thing of legend. Standing in front of these 38 athletes, he held up a football in his right hand and looking at the men in the eye, simply said to them, this is a football. <laughs> and then he built the rest of the season on that statement. This is a football. His team would become the best in the league and six months later they would play the New York Giants in the NFL championship, the equivalent in those days of the Super Bowl, and beat them 37 to 0. Now, with that in mind, backtrack 2,000 years to another locker room, so to speak. If you'd have walked into this locker room on that day or the day after the crucifixion of Jesus, 
you would have found another team, a beaten team, a battered team of men and women who were in shambles. Their morale was as low as it could be, down in the depths. They were broken. They were dazed. They were confused. They had just experienced the greatest defeat of their existence. Nothing that they could have ever imagined or dreamed up. The one they had given up everything to follow. They'd staked all their hopes and dreams on this one man, this carpenter teacher from Nazareth. He had just been flogged and crucified, so bloody and beaten that he was virtually unrecognizable. And the future that they had fantasized about with Jesus as king over Israel, and them serving by his side as his, as, as his administrative team, that dream was done, obliterated, gone, <laughs> over. And here they were hiding out, dreading a knock at the door from Roman soldiers coming to take them away and potentially crucify them for insurrection, for being associated with Jesus. <laughs> so that's the scene that we have. Now fast forward 50 days. This same group of beaten, bedraggled, brutalized people charged back out into the streets of Jerusalem, back onto the same playing field, so to speak, with a confidence and conviction and a boldness that defied all logic. They would go on literally to become the most dominant force in all of history. Get this clear the most dominant force in all of history, a movement of people that would shake the whole planet, that would turn the world upside down. So it begs the question, what in the world happened? The simple answer, and you know the answer, is the resurrection of Jesus happened. A fully alive Jesus walked into their locker room and declared, this is a football. He bottom-lined it for them. He took them back to the most fundamental and foundational fact of their faith, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he built everything else from that fundamental fact, upon that fundamental fact. If you call yourself a Christian one who follows the Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus is the football. You take the football away, you take the resurrection away, and everything else falls to pieces. All the other details are irrelevant. That is how important the resurrection of Jesus is and was, particularly to this brand new baby church. The resurrection of Jesus, as I've been studying the book of Acts, this has been fascinating to me, I don't know how I missed this. Over all the years of, of the times that I've studied scripture, but I didn't realize that the resurrection of Jesus is the heartbeat of the whole book of Acts. You take out the resurrection and the book of Acts literally crumples like a pop can that's run over by a semi. It just flattens. There's nothing there. The resurrection is the heartbeat of the whole book of Acts. 24 times... In multiple messages and speeches and declarations in front of large groups of people, in front of emperors, in front of the Supreme Court of Israel, in front of all sorts of groups, all of the messages that are spoken, they focus their message on the resurrection of Jesus. The whole early church was literally birthed and powered by the resurrection of Jesus. We've got to get this clear in our heads. Now, I heard, an, I heard this past week an amazing interview with Dr. Gary Habermas. I actually had him as a professor years ago in university. He's considered one of the foremost authorities on this issue of the resurrection, this event of the resurrection. He's getting ready to release a book of 5,000 5, pages on evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And he made a statement in that interview that boggled me. He said this, Skeptics really don't argue anymore against the evidence of the resurrection. There, it is so 
abundant and overwhelming. They don't have really any answers. They just choose not to accept the evidence because they don't like the conclusion. Unbelievable. <laughs> now, I want to tell you a story of one of these skeptics. It's fascinating. This is a story of Frank Morrison. He is a lawyer. He approached this whole thing from the standpoint of a lawyer, with a lawyer's mind. Now, Frank was an admirer of Jesus. He thought the life of Jesus was one of the most beautiful ever lived, but he believed that the resurrection was just a myth tacked on at the end. So he set out to write an intelligent and rational account of Jesus, but refuting the resurrection. Now, what emerged was uh, would become his best-selling book entitled, Who Moved the Stone? And here's what happened. As he approached the facts of the resurrection with his legal and his legal background, his legal mind, and his training, he had to alter course. He had to change his mind. So much so that the first chapter of his book was titled, The Book That Refused to Be Written. <laughs> and then all of the remaining chapters deal clearly and concisely and, de and decisively with the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Powerful story. There's a recent book that has been published by secular, non-believing Jews, where they acknowledge that the, Christ, the early Christians were the religion of the resurrection. They were the resurrection religion. So, brothers and sisters, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are part of the resurrection religion. The resurrection religion. That's who we are. So, let's go back to our text. It says that Jesus appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days. 40 days. Now, what is uh, important about 40 days? Well, first of all, the number 40 and the period of 40 days, 40 years, etc., is alluded to in Scripture 146 times. It's a vitally important number. When you see the number 40, just mark it down. Something important is going down. Something that is going to impact history. 40, or the period of 40 days or 40 years, or the number 40, indicates preparation, training, refining, testing. Give you an illustration of this. Moses' life was divided up into three groups of 40. The first 40, he was being trained and prepared to lead as royalty in Egypt. The second 40, he was being humbled and trained and prepared as a, as a shepherd out in the wilderness. The third 40, he led the children of Israel through 40 years in the wilderness. The Lord Jesus, as you know, started his ministry with 40 days and nights, fasting and praying and battling it out with the devil, preparing him, testing him, getting him ready for the three years of ministry that would lead to the cross, his burial, and his resurrection and then his ascension back to build the church. 40 years. So what was this 40 years that Jesus had with the disciples? It was a 40-day, not 40 years, 40-day boot camp. It was a boot camp getting them ready to launch the first church, to start this next movement that would take us right into history, right into eternity. Here's what had happened. You know from last message, the disciples had been broken down. Their vision of who Jesus was and what he had come to do was at completely at odds with Jesus himself. And they had to be broken down. They had to fail. They had to have their pride, their agendas drained out of them before they would be ready to embrace what Jesus came to do. And so here they are, prepared. Jesus had trained them, but now their hearts are prepared. They're humble. They're teachable. They're not self-confident, but they're ready to, be, to place their confidence in a new source. So they've been broken down. Now Jesus is going to build them back up. Now was the time for him to build them back up, prepare them for battle. So this 40 days was a time of fine-tuning and focus. They had to be crystal clear, and Jesus had to help them become crystal clear about two things. 
Number one, his identity, who he was. They had to know clearly who he was, his person. But number two, his itinerary, his plan. What was Jesus' agenda? Because it certainly wasn't their agenda. So in the next couple weeks, we're going to talk about these two things. So why was this so vital? Why was it so vital that they understood clearly who he was and clearly what his plan was? Two reasons. Number one, they were going to endure intense persecution and, op and, and, and opposition. And you know this, just thinking from a human psychology standpoint, if you go into incredible opposition and you have any doubts in your mind, you're going to fold up your tent, you're going to go home. Jesus knew they had to be 1,000% confident about who he was and what he was going to do, or they would quit when they started having their homes taken, their loved ones taken, people were going to jail. When the, when the fire of persecution started to be lit, they had to be confident in who Jesus was. But secondly, Jesus had promised, and the Father was going to send the gift of the Holy Spirit, the same power source that raised Jesus from the dead. And that was going to not only be on them, but in them. <laughs> they had to know clearly the plan of God and the person of God, because when the power of God entered them, that power had to be focused. They couldn't be driving in the fog with this great new power. They had to be clear on their direction. So persecution was coming, but God's power was coming. So they had to know the person and the plan of God crystal clear. And that was Jesus' mission over that 40 days. So how did he do it? Well, let's start off. It says in verse 3, he presented himself alive with many convincing proofs. The, world pr the word presenting literally means to put oneself in dis on display or on exhibit. Jesus came back into their lives after being gone for those three days, after being crucified. He inserted himself back into their lives and put himself on exhi exhi exhibition, on display for them to see, for them to touch, for them to eat with. It also means to put oneself on the witness stand. And even further, it means to enter one's fellowship or intimacy. So how did Jesus do this? He put himself on exhibit, on display, on the witness stand by being with them, letting them talk with him, eat with him, touch him, <laughs> such that in 1 John, John says clearly, this Jesus we touched, we saw, uh, we, we were with him, we held him with our hands, this is 60 years later, John is testifying to these 40 days where Jesus was with them. Today we want to talk about one simple thing. He had to convince them that he was really alive, that he was really alive. These guys had spent three years with him. They had seen Jesus' life in 3D color. They had watched him demonstrate his power in many different ways. Power over disease. They had watched him heal blind men, deaf men, mute men, people with withered hands, people with who were crippled. They had seen Jesus heal virtually every person, people with issues of blood. They had watched Jesus in power over disturbances, natural disturbances. The, the story of Jesus sleeping in the boat on the way across the lake of, of the Sea of Galilee He's sleeping and the boat is being swamped and the disciples are frantic and they say, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? We're going to sink. Jesus wakes up, rubs his eyes and almost like a, child, a parent scolding an unruly child, he says, hush, be still. And the wind and the waves whew, calm right down. Can you imagine that moment? And the disciples simply ask the question, who is this who has power, even the wind and the waves obey him. But they weren't clear yet who he was. Well, they get out of the boat on the other side and they walk up and they encounter a man with 1,000, 1,000 if not more demons, legion. This man had terrorized a 10 city region. But Jesus walks calmly up to him, has a dialogue, and within minutes, it seems, is commanding 
1,000 plus demons to leave this man and they are entering a herd of pigs who thunder down the slope and off a cliff into the Sea of Galilee. Get that picture in your mind. You don't forget that one anytime soon. The disciples had seen Jesus perform all sorts of things. They knew he was powerful, but even further, they had seen him raise three people from the dead. A 12-year-old girl, a boy who was in his coffin, a young man in his coffin on his way to be buried. Jesus raises him on his way to his own funeral. And then finally, his dear friend Lazarus, who was already in the grave, four days rotting, stinking, Jesus raises him back to life again. They knew that Jesus was powerful, but they had watched and witnessed and they had heard of how Jesus had been flogged and crucified and they knew what that meant. The cat of nine tails, the whip that Jesus was flogged with, had intertwined within it glass and, and metal and bone. And when that whip connected with the human flesh, it would literally turn the back and the body of a person into hamburger, into like a plowed or tilled field. Many didn't even survive the cat of nine tails. They would bleed out. They would die before they even made it to the cross. They would be beaten to a pulp, so bloody they couldn't even be recognized. And Jesus had that was, by the way, that whipping, that scourging was reserved for only two types of people, traitors and murderers. <laughs> but somehow Jesus was scourged as a, either a murderer or a traitor. He took the place of Barabbas, who was a murderer, so likely it was for murder. <laughs> but then he went to the cross. The cross was the most brutal, torturous death known to mankind. And the disciples were very familiar with it. If you study the history of Israel around that time, they had likely seen dozens, if not hundreds of people that had been crucified. They knew nobody survived crucifixion, nobody. And Jesus had been both flogged and crucified. He'd had a spear rammed into his side, into his heart. And the disciples knew game over, <laughs> game over. Jesus is powerful, but nobody, nobody survives this. Game, set, match. And that's why in Luke 24, when the women came to Jesus after having gone to the tomb on Sunday morning, encountered an empty tomb, encountered two angels who reminded them of what Jesus has said, that he would die and be buried and resurrected the third day. They ran to tell the news to the disciples. There were multiple women, not just a couple, but a whole group of them. The disciples, it says in Luke chapter 24, thought it was all nonsense. They wrote it all off as nonsense, and it says they would not believe. Not much later, Jesus appears to the disciples, but Thomas isn't there, and he proves his, his resurrection to the, to the disciples, but Thomas isn't there. And Thomas, regardless of all their testimony, added to the women's testimony, said, until I stick my fingers in the nails in the holes where the nails were, and I put my hand in the slit in his side. I will not believe. So what does Jesus do? I want to read this passage to you. This is so powerful in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Eight days later, the eight days prior, the disciples had told them, the Lord is alive. And Thomas said, you're full of it. And so eight days later, it says, his disciples were inside and Thomas was with them and Jesus came, the doors having been shut and stood in their midst. So Jesus is in his brand new supernatural body that is not uh, inhibited by walls. It's supernatural. It can travel through uh, solid objects. So he just appears in the room and he says to them, peace be with you. And then he singles out Thomas like a, like a heat-seeking missile. He goes right to Thomas. He says, Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And then he says, and be not unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Mission accomplished. 
That was precisely the clarity that Jesus had to create in the hearts and minds in every fiber and cell of his disciples. They had to be clear that Jesus was Lord. That means he has authority in every realm, in every region, not just over disease and physical disturbance and demons and the death of others, but over death itself. He is Lord, and that makes him God, because nobody but God has that kind of authority. And Thomas declared it, my Lord and my God. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. So, Jesus had to make sure they were clear on his identity. So I want to answer the question, so what? What does this mean for us? Why is this important to us today? Number one, as they were bold, we too can be bold about the identity of Jesus. We can be bold about the identity of Jesus. The, re the resurrection wasn't some feel-good story, some fable that was made up. When the disciples were confident, when they were absolutely certain of who Jesus was, they were filled with confidence. They were filled with persuasiveness, with conviction, with resilience. There was a steel in their backbone, a fire in their hearts. It transformed them. It transformed them. When they spoke, their words had weight. When they spoke, they didn't shuffle. They looked people directly in the eye and declared what they knew to be fact. Jesus was alive. Jesus was Lord. Jesus was God. Jesus, Jesus was unlike any of the others who had come before and un, unlike any others who would come in the future. Jesus was absolutely uniquely Lord and God. He had conquered death. He was alive. The grave couldn't hold him and they were certain of it. It is an amazing thing we will study in Acts chapter 4 when Peter, this blue collar, dirt under his fingernails, uneducated roughneck, stands up in front of the Supreme Court of Israel with the high priest there who is essentially a pope or a president. That's how much power he held. And here's Peter. Who is Peter? Peter's a, a retired fisherman. And he stands up and he says this, he declares with authority, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men whereby we must be saved. He declared it and then he gave his life for it. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says this, the God of this world talking about Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan's great, great mission is to blind people to who Jesus is. He doesn't want people to know who Jesus really is. That's why if you want to identify a cult, they have two distinct characteristics. Number one, they always add to the scriptures. They add to the scriptures. But secondly, they minus, they take away from the person of Jesus every single time. Mark it down. A cult will add their own material to the scriptures and they will take away from the person of Jesus. So let me just bottom line it. If the person or the idea or the philosophy or the particular brand of spirituality that you or someone else is placing their faith in doesn't worship the man who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was crucified for claiming to be God, was buried in a rich man's tomb, but came out of that rich man's tomb three days later in a new and supernatural body, if he, she, it doesn't qualify on all those points, that philosophy, that spirituality, that person cannot save you. That is a counterfeit from the God of this world who wants to blind you to who Jesus is. Brothers and sisters, it's not Jesus plus something or someone else. It's not that Jesus is one option among many 
in the world of spirituality. It's not Jesus is even the best option among many. It's Jesus is the only option because of the resurrection. Be clear about this. Now, is this position politically correct? No. Will some consider it narrow-minded? You bet. Will it create division? Certainly will. Jesus predicted that the, the debates around himself would tear families apart. Will you be persecuted for holding this absolutely no unwavering position about Jesus? Will you be persecuted? Certainly will. Will we be willing to give our lives for this declaration about the person of Jesus? I can't speak for you, but I say by God's grace, absolutely. Absolutely. So number one, you can be bold about the person of Jesus, who Jesus was, who Jesus is, the one who's coming again. You can be bold, unwavering, certain, constant, resilient in your testimony about who Jesus is. Number two, you have a bold and simple testimony to share. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter is exhorting the believers, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that is within you. Always be ready to make a defense. I've talked to many Christians. They say, I have no testimony. I haven't been to jail. I haven't been on drugs. I haven't lived on the street. I haven't committed a crime. I haven't done all these heinous things. Therefore, I have no testimony. Baloney. Christianity is very simple, brothers and sisters. Our witness is very simple. Our testimony is very simple. It doesn't have to be about us. It shouldn't be about us. When the believers charged out into the streets, they weren't talking about how sinful their lives had been. They were declaring the greatness of Jesus. <laughs> that is our testimony, that Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He rose from the grave, and he's coming back. That's all you need for the most powerful testimony that you can possibly have. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. <laughs> it's about Jesus. And if you ever start to wonder and wander, wonder and wander and get lost in the weeds of debate about predestination or the free will of man or, or who are the Nephilim or, or this, that, and the other thing, forget it. Get out of those weeds and come back to the basics. Jesus is alive and he's coming back. That's all you need to know. That is so simple. The devil wants to convolute this. He wants to complicate it. He wants to get your mind all filled with a bunch of, of distraction. No, Jesus is alive and he's coming back. That's all you need to know. That's your testimony. Praise the Lord. That simplifies everything. Now, number three. Number three, you can be bold in the face of dire circumstances. You can be bold in the face of any circumstances. We have, because of the resurrection, the resurrection principle. And what is that? I've taught about it in the past. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. Those three days where Jesus, they thought, was in the grave. He'd come out of the grave and was working. <laughs> he had descended into the abyss and he had emptied paradise. I mean, that's another message. So Jesus wasn't just laying in the grave rotting. He was at work. But the disciples didn't know that. But when we're down to nothing, when we think God is doing nothing, just wait. He's up to something. That is the resurrection principle. When your marriage is down to nothing, I've watched this over and over and over. Marriages that I thought had no hope, they were as good as dead. Roll the stone over the tomb, they're done. <laughs> Put the fork in it, it's cooked. And God raises it from the dead and makes it a testimony of his power and his grace. I've seen it dozens of times. So if you're listening to this and your marriage is struggling, you have the resurrection principle at your disposal. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. Are your kids prodigals? Are they wandered away from the Lord? Guess what? The resurrection principle applies to you. When your kids are down to nothing, when you think that they're gone, God is up to something. 
the resurrection principle. You can live every day bold. You can live in dire circumstances with boldness because when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. Life comes out of death. We live by that principle as believers. We don't see death as the final stop. It's not a period at the end of the sentence. It's just maybe a pause. But man, there's greatness coming. I love Tony Campolo's great message. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Jesus was crucified on Friday, but he rose on Sunday. It may be Friday in your life, but Sunday's coming. You trust that Jesus is at work. The resurrection principle is at work in your life and in the lives of so many. Maybe it's your finances, whatever it might be, the resurrection principle. You can be bold in any circumstance because of the resurrection of Jesus. But number four, you can be bold in the face of death. You can be bold in the face of death. Have you thought about the fact that the way you approach death, the way you think about death, the way you handle your own death, you might be suffering with cancer or whatever it is, is one of the greatest testimonies that you can ever have. In the New Testament church, the boldness that the believers had because they no longer feared death was attractive and unbelievable. Stephen's death, being crushed to death by stones in Acts chapter 8, we'll get there, was the thing that brought Saul, who was the number one Christian killer and opposer, to Jesus. He saw the death of Stephen, the dignified, bold, courageous death of Stephen. Stephen looked death in the face and he didn't flinch, not one moment, because he knew that if Jesus had raised from the dead, so would he. Death was no longer fear creating for him. Here's what Hebrews 2.14 says says, Jesus rendered powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those, that could be you, who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. Brothers and sisters, fear creates slavery, and the fear of death creates incredible slavery. We've seen this during this pandemic, how People's fear of death has created slavery. They've become in bondage. They've become slaves to this fear of death. As believers, I'm encouraging you, you don't have to live in fear. You shouldn't be living in fear. I was in Sri Lanka some years ago uh, doing mission work, and I was, Sri Lanka is the little tear shaped island nation on the southeast coast of India. And I was in the capital city of Colombo. And a little man came up to me with a basket on his head. And he clearly wanted to show me something. And I knew what he wanted to show me. Inside that basket was a king cobra. (laughs) Well, I said no, but he he insisted. So he took down the basket. He pulled off the top and up popped a king cobra. And out came his flute. And we did the whole snake charming deal. (laughs) And I stood way back. I hate snakes. Well, after the snake went back in the basket, I had someone interpret for me and found out that that cobra had no fangs. <laughs> they had to fang the cobra, so there was no danger whatsoever. He looked dangerous. He looked terrifying to me. I, I, I hate snakes, but he had no fangs. Brothers and sisters, listen. The resurrection of Jesus means that death has no fangs. It might seem like a king cobra. It might terrify you like a king cobra, but death has no fangs. Jesus has defanged the cobra. Let me give you three fangs. What are three fangs of fear that Jesus has pulled out of the cobra? Number one, not knowing what is on the other side of death. This is a major fear for people. We don't know what is on the other side of death, or they don't know what is on the other side. It's this great curtain with a huge question mark or darkness or unknown on the other side. Fang number one. Fang number two is the possibility uh, that on the other side is torment, suffering, pain, torture, punishment. And the third fang that that I've thought of is the permanence of it all. Not only do we not know what's on the other side and think that it possibly could be our worst nightmare, but it could go on indefinitely. Three fangs of death. Well, guess what, guys? 
The Lord Jesus has plucked all of those. In the scripture, we have an answer to all of those. Not knowing what is on the other side of death, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, to be absent from the Lord or to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that on the other side of death is Jesus, the presence of the Lord. Awesome. That's why I said, I, I don't know whether to stay or go. I want to go to be with the Lord, but you guys need me here, so I guess I'll stay for a little while longer to build you up in your faith. But I want to go to be with Jesus. I want to go on the other side of the curtain because that's where Jesus is. <laughs> Secondly, the reality of torment. For those of us who know Jesus, what does the scripture say? It says, Jesus taught in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions, not torment, mansions. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. That's not torment. Jesus took torment for us when he went on the cross. If we have placed our faith in Jesus, all the torment was taken by Jesus when he hung on the cross. We get life. We get the presence of Jesus. We get a mansion. We get the glory of heaven. Revelation. Read Revelation. It'll blow your mind what, what is waiting for us. The third fang is the permanence of it all. And yes, the Bible says that both heaven and hell are permanent. But Jesus, in John 3.16, Jesus said this, For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus was talking about himself, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Not everlasting torment, everlasting life. Jesus plucked the fangs of death, the fear of death. We don't have to fear it. We can live boldly because of the resurrection of Jesus. We're free from the fear of death. I want to close with this thought, you guys. I want to close with this. I got an email a couple days ago from a pastor, and he was talking about Easter's coming in 39 days, trying to prepare the team, prepare everyone for Easter. Easter's coming in 39 days, and I thought as I was preparing this message, no, <laughs> that is not the case. For a believer, Easter is every day. Resurrection Day is every day. We live, this is the football. <laughs> we live in the constant reality that Jesus came up out of the grave, was buried, but came out of the grave. We live in that reality of a living, powerful Lord and God, the Lord Jesus Christ, every single day. Easter is not just one time a year. It's every day for us. We are the resurrection religion. And I want to challenge you guys. I want to challenge you this, that in the next week and starting moving forward, that as you get out of bed in the morning as you contemplate moving into your day that you pause and you contemplate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and say out loud to yourself, he's alive. Jesus is alive. He is risen. Jesus is risen. The greeting that believers had for one another would come to be, he, he is risen. He is risen indeed. They would they would greet one another, reminding one another that Jesus was alive. That's why we get up in the morning. That's why we do what we do. That's why we sacrifice. That's why we say no to certain things and yes to other things. Because Jesus is alive. He's not just a concept. Brothers and sisters, do not allow yourself to live as if Jesus was dead. He's not dead. Jesus is alive the heartbeat of the book of Acts. And Jesus had to be clear in those 40 days. He had to make sure the disciples were clear. He was alive. And I trust that this teaching, you will be clear. Jesus is alive. He was alive then. He's alive now. And he's coming back. We're going to talk about that in weeks to come. Hang on to your hats. I'm going to pray. May God bless your week. Jesus, drive this home to us in a powerful way. May we live this week. May we wake up in the morning and before we do anything else, declare that you are alive. You came up out of the grave. You conquered death. And we live in light of your resurrected life. We don't have to fear death. We have a simple testimony. We can live every day understanding that it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. You're at work. 
Oh God, we are confident about who you are. You are Lord and you are God. And we worship you today in the powerful, risen name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Bless you guys. We will see you next episode here in the wrestling room with your Bibles, Book of Acts. See you soon.